have a question here. Hi there, uh, Robert Klaschka from uh, Sumo Services and BIM for SME. Um, we've obviously in the UK we've had a 10 year commitment to mandating um, collaborative workflow, um, which seems to have sort of gone a little bit out of the window with the current government. Um, the employment of the uh, Construction Leadership Council, which is mostly big main contractors, very interested parties in keeping things exactly the same as they are. There's a lot of protests going on over here at the moment, uh, over in, in the UK at the moment. Um, so I'd be interested to understand what the speakers think about um, whether um, collaborative working um, and the promise of BIM can be left to the market or whether it needs to be mandated. Um, you've probably got a feel for which I think it is. David? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I haven't broken a knife up. Um, yeah, um, collaborative working. Um, and I would be lying if I was to say that we have the most collaborative forms of contract in the world. Um, but there are reasons for that. Um, we, uh, I suppose, I, I, without going into the entire history of why we are where we are, um, we have, I suppose, we've embarked on a process of review of those contracts and we have found, that's why I'm saying we have found without any shadow of a doubt that they have not been collaborative. But um, as a, a former colleague of mine had said previously at one of these procurement conferences was, well, there's not a whole lot of point in blaming the car, uh, you know, for the, for, for the crash if you're not driving it properly. So you know, we have found through the review process that there have been uh, quite a number of problems from the point of view of understanding, and I was interested in the concept of change, change comes slowly. Well, I'm still not sure that people fully get a contract that was introduced back in 2007 because it meant it was a radical departure from what went before. Um, but weirdly enough, the more I look at the what are put forward as collaborative forms of contract, the NEC form of contract, for example, uh, the more we see huge similarities with our contract. And what we're beginning to understand is that it's the way the contract is operated. So this is what we're getting at. We've gone back to the, to the basics really, really here. It's about information, and it's about providing certainty to those that are pricing the job. And obviously, BIM will greatly assist in, in doing that. Uh, thereafter, it is about relationships, and it's about, in some cases, where parties either get off on the wrong foot or there's person. I mean, it, it, we've all been there. It can be a personality clash in, in as many cases as it is what's written in a clause in a contract. Um, it's about certainty of purpose, and it's about certainty of outcome. And the government wants certainty of outcome, that's for sure. Uh, and we, we, we absolutely have to ensure that. And so the contract is built up in that way. But I think the misunderstanding that aris has arisen is our notification requirements, which are common in FIDIC, they're common in the NEC as well. People see these as pushing people into an adversarial position straight away, when in fact the intention is to just understand where the project is at a certain time. And so we are looking at that. We've taken some steps in terms of dispute resolution. We have to call it dispute resolution because it is a difference of opinion, at our view or on, on price or cost or whatever it might be. So we are, we are looking at that. How BIM will, will, will assist, well, I mean, from, from our perspective, it's quite obvious. It gives you that certainty from the outset. And it doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room for people to be arguing whether that was in or out of the contract, which is essentially what we've found in, in a number of cases, uh, because we, we are looking for a lump sum fixed price contract. We're not looking at a target cost, we're looking at a lump sum fixed price. Obviously, if you move to target cost, that changes the game to a huge degree and, and people can work together in a collaborative way. But government policy at this juncture is cost certainty. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Uh, it's just an observation. I'm essentially retired out of the whole construction business. I, I have been uh, listening to the debate that has gone on about the GCCC. And uh, every so often I come across articles of practice in other countries, and one struck me, given the fact that, in essence, 
the intention of the government contract is to transfer risk, virtually all risk, to the people providing the services to them. I see some places are trying to actually document those risks as part of the big documents and to decide who in actual fact should carry those risks. Have, has any consideration been given to that approach? Yeah, I mean, we, we've taken a large step in that direction uh, without, again, we will be moving on to a, a much more sophisticated risk management, but that's outside the contract. We, we have to build its baby steps because it's our view that quite often risk isn't recognised at all. In fact, many people don't understand what risk is, what it is, where it lies and who should be managing it. So, for example, um, the key decision we've made was to change the position of the bill of quantities. At the moment, you can choose to have the bill as a risk. Uh, so if it's not defined in the bill, it it can be decreed to be a compensation event. But with one or two exceptions, most contracting authorities go to the default position, which is transfer that risk. So we've taken that option out in the, when the amended forms are, 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 are published. So again, because the, con the, the, fi the concept of a lump sum was based on adequate design information up front, we've put the bill back in front and center. And so if it isn't in the bill, it's deemed to be a, a, a compensation event. So we are moving towards it, but I, I think we need to look at, um, and we, we're, we've discussed how this can be done, but it starts at project inception on the site, and um, site acquisition, right from there, and we need to get that discipline running right through. Rather like the, 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 the methodology has been adopted in health and safety, similar sort of process, identify, manage, mitigate, eliminate, and they then basically describe and pass on. That's the way we're going to work. I'd, I'd just like to add to that. I mean, just in terms of contracts, and there, there can be too much weight. I agree. I think it'd be too much weight put on the actual contract and the form itself. Um, I've personally, through what, 20 years, have run lots of different types of contracts. And it's almost always down to the culture and the attitude of the people involved. And I think while I spoke earlier about the, 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 the research hub, uh, being, and I think Louis talked about it as well, being delivered on time, uh, on budget, etc. And BIM certainly was a, a hugely helpful tool. But the attitude and the aptitude of everyone involved, the design team and especially the contractor, um, Jimmy O'Keefe, who was the main guy in BAM, uh, and the rest of his team, was excellent. I mean, they were, they were, they were brilliant. And I don't think we ever talked about the contract. Mm. You know, and, and I've done work with CISC and smaller contractors and all that. And once everyone's in the same room, uh, we all have the same objective. We won an award for SIPR, which was done with a GCCC uh, traditional build contract, traditional uh, employer design. Uh, we won an award in Madrid for uh, project management for collaborative working. So that was a major international award using what is meant to be one of the worst contracts in the world for uh, collaborative working. And uh, so it's, it's again, it's about culture, attitude, and uh, everyone working in the one direction. We delivered, I think, 23 million euros worth of work over uh, 11 months in, in, in infrastructure. So it was, it was a very, very significant, very, very challenging project. It would not have worked, no matter what contract we had, if Roadbridge and our design team weren't gonna work with us. And that's, that's the essential, one of the key essential points uh, uh, that, that everyone needs to bear in mind in that debate. Um, okay, uh, any more? Yep, over here. Over here. Uh, just a small observation, more than anything else, in relation to the presentation from Enterprise Ireland. Whenever there's a conversation about BIM, uh, there's generally a comparison between the progress made in the automotive industry and the progress made in the construction industry. And I do think it does a bit of a disservice to the construction industry as a, as a whole. What people tend to forget is that every Ford Focus is exactly the same. Every building is usually bespoke with a different client. And I would love to know what the impact, for example, might be in the process if you were to ask for your Ford Focus with six wheels, two boots, uh, two extra sunroofs, uh, and maybe room for a second steering wheel at the rear so you could drive it in both directions. The point being is that they are very, very different processes. 
A Ford Focus, there's thousands and thousands of them made. They're all the same, which is why you can build an engine in 36 seconds. So if we were to build our houses like that, that's a different debate. But when it comes to a complex, multidisciplinary process with different skill sets to build a building that sits on one site, I don't think it's a particularly good comparison. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's, that's great. I did apologise um, for making the, the automotive so no, I, I'm very aware of that argument and, and that's very much one I would, I would typically make myself. Um, but I, I, so I, I would normally be on, on your side on this. Um, but to, to offer some, some, some maybe some, some, some counter, I, I think you know, if we refer to uh, Il Ilka's uh, presentation, Ilka May, from earlier, in terms of our ability to, to improve our process and adopt technology, um, it's just a very colourful way of saying that, that there are better ways um, that perhaps we're not exploring because of the constraints that we face, whether they be contractual um, or, or whether they be you know, physical in terms of where we, where we do our work. Um, but there is enormous progress that we're seeing through processes like design for manufacturer assemble, which are being enabled by technology we've never had before. Um, so I, I agree wholeheartedly with your point. Uh, I, 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 I don't make comparisons with automotive lightly, um, but it's just, just, just visually, made, I think, um, just supportable what I was looking for. But thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Just, I mean, one of the hopes I personally have is that the future I, I, I agree. Um, I, I think we're, we're all, yeah, definitely singing off the same hymn sheet when we see BIM as an enabler for, for off-site and we see an enabler for design for manufacturing assembly. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and that was one of the key areas. Okay, I think there was one question from over here. Yeah. Hello. Um, this is uh, for John Hunt. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask you, could you perhaps give us some more details in relation to <clears throat> the BIM enable and BIM implement um, projects, uh, it, specifically um, how much has been allocated to them, over what time span, and how many companies have been assisted to date in relation to those two programs? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the the, the programme for upskilling um, the Irish supply chain in, 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 in BIM capability is, is time limited. Um, it will run um, until the back end of 2016, currently, at which point we'll have a, an opportunity to either make a claim for, for further investment and support, or, or whether we'll have, have been seen to, to have achieved our objectives. Um, we have currently, I think we're somewhere in the order of, of 25 to 30 companies have been through a, a support program uh, around BIM with Enterprise Island. Um, and you know, it would be our ambition um, to, to get closer to, to 100 within the, the next 12, 14 months, 100 organizations. And how much is the actual the, um, the, uh, this is, this is, um, I think this is in, in public domain. It, it's somewhere in the order of, of 1.5 million euro of, of support for training. Um, I, I, I don't know, but as, as a rough proportion, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe 25%. Okay, we have one more question, I think, down here. Yeah, hi, um, Robert Cummins, Cummins from Urban Architects. Um, I suppose I have an observation and then I have a question as well. But, um, like, I think that you know, there's comments here, like say the UK and making being mandatory and stuff like that. And then over here, we're kind of saying, well, we won't shoehorn the people into it. But, you know, I would say that, you know, and whether the market should decide whether it's used or not like that. But, you know, I think the governments have a massive role to play. You know, you don't have to make it mandatory. But, I mean, we already have a huge amount of rules when it comes to what contract is to be used on a, on a public project and all sorts of rules. So like, you know, probably on, you know, who's going to do the projects for you, whether it's contractor, or architects, whatever, you know, really, I think, you know, the government needs to put more and more weighting on use of BIM because of the, the advantages of it. And really, you know, when we, 
when we look at the progress, you know, we're not doing, we're doing well in, in some ways, but we're, we're not doing very well in lots of other ways and very practical things every day on, on projects like printing out 14 copies of drawings for a planning application for a protective structure, you know, big enough project and we're just piling up boxes of paper like this and it's kind of insane, you know, like that, that aspect of it is so far off of where it should be. Our planning system, you know, in terms of buildings, we, you know, we should have a model of our city and, and drop it in. There's little steps, but, you know, the governments have a huge part to play. If the government doesn't lead, uh, you know, things are going to be very slow and, you know, we'll be coming back here in 10 years and we'll be, you know, we'll, we won't have moved on. So I suppose I just had an interesting uh, question then in terms of the children's hospital, um, you know, BIM level two, but how did you, what did you submit when you submitted the planning application? Yeah. Submitted documentation, yeah. yeah. Submitted documentation. Sorry? Documentation, yeah, the model wasn't submitted for planning application. No. Yeah, yeah, no, but like, I mean, well, did you, yeah, I presume you printed out all the drawings. And, absolutely, yeah, yeah, there was yeah, a yeah. pile of drawings in our, in our office and everyone worked really hard to put it together. It was a massive, massive application. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> More for not, I didn't like to see it coming in the door. I'd say, um, uh, yeah. yeah, it's definitely, definitely documentation. Yeah. yeah so, but like you know that, okay. We did so send the, the the model, the the flight through as well. Went went along with it, and we yeah. we did a lot of visualizations which came out of the model. Sure. Um, but, but yeah. Yeah. So, but like th that's an example then that maybe you know going forward, that like you know initially, you know it wouldn't be mandatory, but maybe you know if you submit digitally or something your application that it's fast tracked a bit like it's four weeks quick or something some incentives to start with a soft changeover and then after five years or something then you make it mandatory because yeah. I remember like uh, back late even when the you know they started tightening up in the late 90s about smaller applications but I like there was lots of applications accepted with hand drawings or sketch drawings for planning you know so anyway sure, yeah. all right I think that's a that's a dream we think we'd all like you know we, yeah. I think in Singapore they do it in 24 hours or 48 hours or something like that. Uh, so yeah, one of those days it'll happen. Um, maybe maybe we'll all be there. Maybe not. Um, so I just I, I, I have to finish up. So um, we'll do one quick one, one just quick. You're you first up. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm I'm my name is Shane Brody. I work with a private company, owner rep. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is thank the GCC for the development of the uh, dispute resolution business in Ireland, because uh, I've got to deal with it <laughs> so, as a follow on. Uh, but my question is the same question as I asked earlier, is why not as a matter of policy, which seems to be policy in the UK, policy in Germany, to use the technology, or not even use it, set the outcome requirement for reduction in carbon footprint reduction in operating carbon. Instead, we, we as a country are carrying on building it in. Why, why is that not a policy change? And is, or is that something to be addressed that just government and no one else can answer it? I can't answer no. Um, no. It's not our area. And we'll be shot for doing so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it, so it has been discussed then? Uh, yeah, well, it's a matter for the Department of the Environment in terms of uh, all things, building regulations, uh, carbon footprint, all that area. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just in practical terms, we are, we, we, that's our aim as well, not to utilise BIM for our sustainability and cutting carbon, but as regards to national policy, um, I don't know, it's happening All right, okay. All right, okay, thanks very much.